Hi everyone, my name is Big Mac by Gillette. Today I thought I would give an introduction to the student's T distribution. Uh, this is going to be broken up into two parts basically, and I'll explain those in just a second. So first of all, let's uh, just talk about some setup and motivation for this thing. We'll talk about a basic derivation and follow through one example. Uh, we'll then get into a little more complicated material, uh, talking about how this is actually in related to other distributions, you know, find some, you know, more complicated derivation proof of it, as well as definitely give a proof of the variance of the student's t distribution. So this uh, particular talk will basically be broken up into two parts, part one, part two. Part one is meant to be, a, uh, is meant to be listened by a more general audience, so particularly, uh, students in high school statistics or perhaps lower level college statistics. Uh, basically we're just gonna, you know, so we're gonna have to talk about a few things. The prerequisites, the things that I hope you guys are at least somewhat familiar with. Uh, for the first part, just, you know, this basic idea of hypothesis testing, perhaps using a z-test, something like that. Uh, familiarity with these uh, normal distributions, as well as just using tables to try and figure out whether or not to accept or reject a certain hypothesis. Uh, in part two, we're going to be talking a lot more of the math behind these distributions. So we're going to talk about probability density functions, the notion of expectation, and we're also going to be doing a lot of uh, nasty looking calculus in terms of substitutions. So if you're not familiar with those things that, you know, you don't have to watch the second part, but you know, you can definitely try and follow along anyway. So what's the motivation for this thing? Uh, we start off by looking at the Z statistic. Of a, of, of a statistical sample. So, you know, basically we can use this statistic to help us gauge how close our mean is to our true, uh, how close our sample mean is that to the true population. So, of course, we can determine x bar as just the average of our uh, data values. And then we would want to compare that to uh, our true population mu, our tr true population mean, mu, uh, with this particular function. We have x bar minus mu over sigma over square root of n. So again, if you're familiar with our basic using the z test, this is where this idea comes from. So of course, when we're using these things, we assume that we know both sigma, the original uh, standard popula or population standard deviation, as well as mu, the original population mean. So of course, we're also assuming our data follows a normal or Gaussian distribution. You know, they both mean the same thing. Uh, we know both mu and sigma, uh, as well as we assume that our data is independent, or data are independent, as well as identically distributed. IID just meaning that our first data point has no correlation to our second data point. You know, so that way it's as if we're just picking a random sample every time. So in particular, the z-statistic, the uh, what is x bar minus mu over sigma over square root of capital N, where N is our uh, sample size, we know that that has a mean of zero and a variance of one. Of course, since the variance is the square of the standard deviation, the standard deviation is also one. Uh, we'll actually refer to this as the standard normal distribution. So that's fine and dandy, but of course, what if we don't actually know the population variance or the population standard deviation? Uh, one thing that we can do instead is use the sample variance, uh, which we have computed here. We basically compare uh, our particular data points from the sample average, since we don't know the true uh, average of the population. Uh, we perform this, and then we divide by n minus 1. Again, there are other reasons behind why it's n minus 1 and not n. Uh, those are beyond the scope of this particular topic, but we use the sample standard deviation. Uh, to try and get an idea of the variance of our uh, data. So of course, can we use this directly into our z-test or how is this going to change our distribution? So of course we can, what we introduce now is the notion of the t-statistic, where basically everything is the same, except instead of this uh, known standard deviation sigma, we just use our sample uh, standard deviation s, of course s being the square root of s squared. So in terms of a qualitative look, uh, we look at the distribution of this thing for different values of n, and we're going to notice that it's very similar looking to our standard normal, but of course it's not quite exactly the same. In fact, it's going to look a little bit more spread out. Um, some people like to call this a fudge factor or just like an error term, especially when you have small, really small values of n, when you have really small sample sizes. But you're going to have that basic bell-shaped curve, but it's not quite as succinct as the uh, standard normal.
Qualitatively, uh, we're going to have to pay attention into one partic more particular detail, which is known as the number of degrees of freedom, the DF or DOF of your data. Uh, basically, that's going to be capital N minus 1. So your sample size, minus 1, and normally that is just called P. So we're going to have to be using our, our uh, particular value of P in this case to try and uh, determine what, is a good what are good boundaries for our particular cases. So uh, just a couple general information, some more general information about the uh, distribution of our t-statistic. Like the standard normal, it has a mean of zero, so that means that it's centered around uh, x bar equals zero, which is what we would expect. You know, we would hopefully want all of our data to average out to the same place. The variance, uh, again, this is part is not necessarily important here, but it's actually proportional to p over p minus two. Of course, using our p is n minus one case, uh, we can just rewrite that in terms of our sample sizes over here. So, of course, we can run uh, t statistics for values of n less than four, but in order to have like a very, you know, in order to have a very succinct uh, comparison, we would like to definitely have at least n equals four in our sample size. Of course, more is better. So, a couple of things to pay attention to. Uh, going back to that. Uh, variance as being as p over p minus 2. So, of course, how that was related, related to n, as n gets very, very large, uh, our variance is actually going to approach the value of 1, which is the same as the standard normal distribution. So, what that tells us is we have a distribution that looks like a bell curve, it has a variance of 1 as n goes to infinity, and it has a mean of 0. So what that basically is telling us is that as n goes towards infinity, our t-statistic is going to basically follow the same distribution as our z-statistic. Uh, depending on what your teacher may say, um, if you have a sample size that is greater than maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 100, you know, again, depends on what your teacher, some, uh, some teachers might just say, oh, if your sample size is greater than, you know, n, then it's go ahead. Then you can go ahead and just assume that your standard of uh, that your sample standard deviation is close enough to the real population standard deviation, and just use a standard z test. Again, that's just more of an approximation issue. But for as n gets larger and larger, since we know we're going to be approaching the z uh, statistic, then usually that's a good enough approximation for what we need. So let's look at one example of these things. Uh, suppose we have that a manufacturer of sprockets, you know those little things on bicycles. Uh, suppose that we know that we are, uh, sprockets have a normal distribution and their average size is 5 units. So one day we have to go and uh, check the quality of these things. So we use a sample size of n equals 13 and we determine that the sample average size is 4.86 units. We also determine that the sample variance is 0.1 units squared. So first of all, uh, 4.86 is not is a little less than 5. So our question is, um, is there something wrong in the sprocket making process? You know, if, you know, is there something indicating? You know, is this enough information for us to indicate that the sprockets are being made smaller than they're supposed to be, which could be indicative of some other kind of either manufacturing error or perhaps just measuring error? So we need to figure out if there's something else going on, or if this was just you know a random happenstance of this particular situation. So since we do not have the uh, actual population standard deviation for the distribution of our sprocket size, then we can use a t-statistic. So uh, again, I assume you guys know some things about hypothesis testing. So let's just use an alpha value of 0 0.05, two-tailed hypothesis test. You know, that way we account for both extremes. Uh, since now we are using a t-statistic, we have to account for our value of p, the degrees of freedom. So uh, that's basically our sample size of minus one, so 13 minus one is 12. Uh, S is going to be our square root of our variance, which we were told was 0.1. So S is the square root of 0.1 in this case. Uh, we compute our T statistic. Uh, we plug it into our calculators and we get a value of approximately negative 1.6, just a little more than that actually. Then what we're going to do is for an alpha value of 0 0.05, of course we have to go to our tables and compare to a 95% interval. So over here on this table, uh, we have our tail probability p, and we also have our degrees of freedom over here, which is basically giving us the number of p being n minus 1 in this case. So since we had a two-tailed hypothesis test with alpha equal 0 0.05, that means that the region on one end of the tail 
has to be half of 0 0.05 or 0 0.025. So that tells us that our tail probability is going to be 0 0.025. We then need to figure out what the important uh, critical value is for 12 degrees of freedom. So using our 0 0.025 over here, we then have to go look down here where we have 12 degrees of freedom and see where those two values match up. So down here it looks like at about our critical value is 2.179 which tells us that if our absolute value of our t-statistic were greater than 2.179, we might want to reject our null hypothesis. But since it's less, we're going to uh, fail to reject our null hypothesis. So we conclude that there is not enough evidence to support the claim that there's something going on with the process. It would just, you know, it just happened to be a natural sample uh, of our particular distribution. So, you know, there's no need to, you know, no, no need to raise an alarm or anything else like that. A few notes really quickly. Um, the process, of course, of this is very similar to running just a hypothesis test with the Z statistic. Uh, we're just going to have to account for our number of degrees of freedom. And of course, just like any regular hypothesis test, our conclusion might change depending on the value of A. And in fact, why did I go out of my, there we go. In fact, going up over here, here's the bottom page of that same table I was showing you earlier. So up here, we, our column was our tail probability. Here's our degrees of freedom. So at 12 degrees of freedom up here, uh, here's our 2.179, which we saw earlier. So one thing that we can observe is that as our value of P keeps getting greater as we have more and more degrees of freedom, notice that uh, our particular uh, critical value approaches the same as that of a regular standard Z statistic, or 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval. So that's definitely gonna, you know, another way to indicate that our t distribution uh, converges to a, Z, a regular standard Gaussian.